this workplace fairness legislation. You don't even fight for yourself, can I depend for you to fight for me? Discrimination in regards to gender that's not covered. The help is it to avoid a situation like that? There's no shame in admitting that. Why would a successful businessman want to become a civil servant? This is your daily catch-up. I love grassroots. <laughs> <laughs> grassroots jelly. <laughs> Boom. Hey Denise. Hey Dan. Do you know that more than 50% of our viewers are not subscribed? How you know I'm not subscribed? It's shocking. What? <laughs> Can you and you please subscribe, please? Fine. Please appreciate it. Back to the episode. Good evening, everybody, which is about the time that you are watching this show. We have a special <laughs> man with us here. He's our Minister for Manpower and Second Minister for Trade and Industry. Welcome, Minister Tan Si Leng. Let's go. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Do you have sir. English name? I'm sure you do, right? You just don't want to use it. My, my ingrown name is uh, <laughs> Tan Si Leng. Nice. You look a bit like an Edmund. William. Okay, so something that I noticed while kind of researching is that you've had quite an interesting path into politics mm. because within a year of getting elected as an MP, you were actually uh, promoted to a minister. Yeah, why is that? Uh? <laughs> I think you got to ask my boss. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, la, you know. Uh. But when he offer you the position, you can say don't want. Cannot. Uh. Uh. <laughs> you know, very different <laughs> <laughs> <with one>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just do it. What, 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 what it's like to because like I mean when we did the research or so, like you were the CEO of like many private healthcare institutions, right? So like you were top dog for a while. What's it like to suddenly have a boss again? Uh that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I've a intentional. I have a, I have a fantastic boss. Nice. I have a fantastic boss. Uh, very, <laughs> <laughs> very visionary, uh also strategic. And at the same time, uh, compassionate. So I enjoy working under him. But growing up, right, did you ever imagine that you would be in the public sector someday? Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I didn't even have to hesitate. Yeah. Right? So yeah. It just came out. yeah. So how, how, did, how did that happen for you? Well, I, I actually uh, volunteered many decades ago. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm old enough to be your daddy. Oh. Yeah, I'm 58. <laughs> Oh, that's not that old. Uh. Huh? Yeah, okay. so, so 30 years ago when I uh, founded my first group, and I think uh, two years into the founding, um, one of the clinics was near um, the Meet the People session branch uh, at Kemangan. Mm. So I started serving as a, as a grassroots uh, volunteer. This was in 1992. And um, I think that, that gave me a, a lot of insights, the sacrifices made by many of these um, volunteers, the grassroots activity, uh, mm. activists. And they are really our unsung heroes, you know, because they come in every week, day in, day out, come rain or shine, they're there supporting residents, mm. um, appeals, helping, helping them to write letters, organizing activities. So you and help them write letters? I mean, I try my best, la, you know, because... Are you overqualified, no man? Huh? Why? There's no such thing as overqualified. I see, I see. Yeah, you must always understand, you know, ying sui si yuan. Uh, you must always remember where I came from, you know, where right. we all came from. But the letter you write, they cannot read because you got doctor handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is that you type, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just sign off. I thought he was gonna ignore that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bitten by technology. Uh. But growing up, right, you were actually more interested in the humanities, and halfway through, you then switched to science, right? My mom, um, she all along she has had um, um, this. Uh, she's grappling with a very chronic and very severe debilitating illness. Right. It's an autoimmune illness. At that time, when she first had it, I remember I was in primary two, 1972. He just had fever and joint swelling for no reason. And, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. She was like one of the first few cases to have this illness oh. in Singapore. Mm. And so she was treated at uh, C. Paipo. C. Paipo at the time, Singapore General Hospital is called C. Paipo. Oh. Uh, I do yeah. remember my grandmother saying huh. that. Uh, <laughs> so, so over years, they tried all kinds of different medication. And then she developed some complications. Mm. And uh, I remember when I was in uh, pre-1, uh, that was in 1981, um, because of a complication, she developed bleeding and she started vomiting blood. So mm. she had actually an ulcer that ruptured oh, and, and she shit. bled. And they, they, the doctors stopped her uh, from certain treatment and she went to a coma. So that oh. actually changed my, my, my life's perspective. It's actually a quite a life-changing event because um, earlier on, uh, I was actually on a humanities program in Hua Chong 
And that would entail, of course, eventually, you know, in those days, a dream, right? First time you thought, well, you're going in, you can go to, can go to uh, uh, England, you know, uh, right. you go to UK to study. Because of the pivot, I decided that, um, you know, if I can work hard, do medicine because some days, some someday in the future, I may end up treating my own, my own, my own folks. You see, yeah. so right. that was one. So sorry, so you were you you actually became a practicing doctor, right? Of course. Then yeah. how come you suddenly this, go this and doctor start a is company? not quite, you know, it's a it's in a no <laughs> maybe, maybe it's in philosophy. MD MD. When you go into medicine, because it's a it's a very practical oriented course, you spend a lot of time traveling, different hospitals, different postings. You need your stethoscope, right? In those days you didn't have all the you know high you buy yourself one, uh, yeah. school like one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like how goes you have to go and buy your own wand and all yeah, that. Yeah. Like you have to go buy yeah. your own yeah. This one <laughs> is uh, you appear wrongly, uh, yeah. you end up with a wrong diagnosis, you fail the exam, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. So you gotta be better make sure you get good one. Then sorry, can I ask you a yeah. medical detour? How much information are you deriving from that? Is it just not just strong heartbeat, weak heartbeat, fast heartbeat, slow heartbeat? Is it ladies? No, it's uh, it's actually quite good. Yeah. So the stethoscope actually picks up the lungs, how you breathe and all that, so you can hear whether the guy is asthmatic, whether he has very deep pneumonia. Then the heartbeat, uh, the heartbeat, first you hear the rhythm. Then you hear the murmurs. It's called a murmur, right? So there's a... I, I you you it. <laughs> whisper. Exactly, yeah. whisper. It's, it's lapshtup, lapshtup. Or it's... Uh, so it, then it tells you how bad the oh valves God. are, whether it, 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 it closes properly. And then there's also, then you must hear the rhythm. So you must sing, you know. It's like a DJ, no. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you okay. get a drift of it, you know. Uh, you know, when you have a, a mid-diastolic murmur, you know, then you hear the rumbling sound like that. Uh, so it's like, like a nice. DJ, yeah. And of course, you cannot uh, you cannot go to disco. That's a trade off because uh, when you have all those loud music, then it your 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 yeah. Then you cannot hear properly. Uh, <laughs> so you must protect your ears. Uh, is to ensure that at every step of the way, our Singaporeans are given equal opportunity. But discrimination in regards to gender, sexual orientation, and criminal history is there a reason why that's not covered? Like this video if you like fairness. Means if you don't like, you are racist, sexist, ageist. What else? Back Nash to the episode. Yep. Mm. What, what was your specialty? I was a GP, okay. a general practitioner. Well, when I graduated, I actually wanted to be a surgeon. Ooh. That was my dream. When I was a kid, I was actually very... I love stitching, you know. Like I, I, okay. You know, seriously, yeah. Okay. You know. And they, they, they were saying, what, you know, why you should be, you know, going out there and then um, doing all the um, uh, woodwork, you know, metalwork and so. But I prefer stitching. I found I was very good Wait, at tying. Wait, is it like embroidery? That kind no, no, no. Oh. Uh, very good at tying knots. Oh. Yeah, I end up tying the knots. I can't, I can't entangle my, I disentangle oh, I myself. Can do this. <laughs> uh, yeah. But then, but then when I when I went on and I uh, assisted in, with some of the surgeries, then I realized that actually I have a knack at tying knots. You know, yeah. so I could. I it's could, such a big thing in surgery. I could do yeah, the, like of course, because you got to tie with one hand, you got to tie with two hands, you got to right, tie with yeah, an yeah, instrument yeah, yeah. and all tie that. So, one hand. so you can do, you can do the scar, uh, depending on the type of sutures that you use. You could oppose it so, so well, right, that you can minimize the scarring. So it's very important. Mm. Right. Yeah. So then you got to stitch muscle and muscle. Then you got to stitch tendon, right? right? Yeah. So all all this thing came in very handy. So I realized <laughs> that uh, maybe. You know, at the time, I, I had a talent for surgery, you see. So I, I actually wanted to be a surgeon. But again, uh, usually it's like that. Nah. Some some <laughs> some changes and so on, the opportunities got, got taken away. It do be like that. Uh, then I, I decided that, uh, pivoted to, to running a business. Nah. So the business of healthcare. But what's that like though? Because like the skill set is so different from being a GP. It's mostly medical skills too. Like running a business, that's business acumen and, and things like that. What's that like? I think it's the, the it's the life of hard knocks. Uh. Okay. You just keep trying, you know. Uh, you 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 get boko here. Sometimes mm. you you get boko there. Um, it, it's hits and misses. Uh, on the average, um, perhaps uh, out of um, uh, ten clinics you set up, maybe two or three of them will fail, right? And but you just got to make sure that there's no shame in 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 admitting that I made a mistake and then stop and make a U turn. Right. So when you went into politics, right, was there a very steep learning curve for you? I'm still learning. Mm. I'm still learning. In private sector, the buck stops with me. I just execute and I move. 
and I get the results the next quarter it will come back either my earnings drop or my earnings go up mm. Mm. in the public sector I need to think of all the millions and millions of ramifications and the permutation before I make a decision uh, that is the difference right so to like actually dive deeper into that right given your experience as a business owner and as like mm. a chief executive officer how has that helped you in your capacity as like minister of manpower I guess uh, partly because I was on the other side uh, so in a way uh, I know a little bit of insights as to what they are thinking mm. their budget consideration when they plan right. uh, what they think of when it comes to redundancies in terms of uh, work what do they think of in terms of incentives rewards right. promotion uh, uh, accountability framework and so on and so forth yeah. Yeah, yeah. How's, your, how's your family thinking? you've done this for a while now well they're very supportive right. uh, increasingly they're wondering uh, whether they've lost me Right. Oh. Yeah. So there are times when uh, I haven't seen seen my kids for weeks. Right. Weeks. Your yeah. kids are presumably quite grown up, lah. They are. They are. They are. Well, you know, to to daddy and mummy, always kids. Right. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. So they may not have seen me for quite some time. But then uh, on and off, they they either catch uh, a snippet of me on TV or or <laughs> the papers. So. Right. Yeah. Then they just hug the newspapers. <laughs> 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 like yeah. What do you think has been like the most challenging thing you've had to navigate so far? Uh, one very big uh, fulfilling thing was was how um, the the vast majority of the migrant workers um, were able to sort of uh, get out of um, this this COVID crisis. Mm. You you started your term right smack COVID, right? Because that, yeah. that's where the cabinet wanted to get mandate from the people and to make the yeah. tough choices for COVID. Yeah. And straight became MOM. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what was that like for you as someone as a doctor? I, it's a lot of it is public health. Prior to that, I was, uh, I, I was actually volunteering in terms of the outreach to the dorm. So I, I've actually been, oh. uh, you right. know, sort of uh, mobilizing my, my past colleagues to help out in terms of the swabbing, Mm. Um, education, uh, you know, in the dorms itself. So, in you, you couldn't say that I was jumping in fresh. La. The key thing is that the series of handoffs, right? It's how you smoothen and integrate that handoffs um, that resulted in a in a more efficient sort of turnaround in terms of of testing, isolation, and so on. So that actually helped quite a fair bit because of of uh, the networks I, I was able to bring to the table. So I think that's that's one uh, very very uh, comforting. Um, you know, sort of uh, um, thought that, that that I had, right? Uh, returning uh, them back to their, the, you know, safely yeah, uh, and well back to their family members back home. Right. In fact, many of them felt safe here in our country working and, and many of them actually come back mm. to work after that. And then how about on like the brighter note? What's something that you've been like proud of like working on mm. or getting to work on? Um, the fact that um, we need to continue to grow our economy and because of the pace of disruptions and also the change that is accelerating so rapidly, we've had to also ensure that whatever new businesses that we bring here and anchor here, they are staffed with the appropriate talent. It's an ABC. How do we anchor the apex, the mm. top talent here, the top enterprises here? Then the B, how do we then build our local enterprises into the broad middle segment and, and the, the, the ec economic spill over to carry the bottom group of people, the vulnerable right. with us. Oh, so literally ABC. Yeah, literally ABC. And, <laughs> and of course... <laughs> when you become a minister, you gotta start coming out with abbreviations. Uh, uh, so then, then now at this particular network, because we are looking at, at to see how to up the ante in terms of our competitive advantage, we also got to protect our people to make sure that they're not discriminated against. Yeah. Hence, the two years we went all hands on deck working very hard you know extensive dialogues discussion with uh, stakeholders and so on to to finally come up with this workplace fairness legislation yeah so speaking of there's been a framework that was proposed this workplace fairness legislation about two to three days ago it just came out mm, at the time of filming and i think like given the recent political like negative press i think <laughs> this is uh, one positive uh, news that i think is really good yeah so if i can briefly summarize right it essentially prohibits workplace discrimination based on five characteristics nationality age sex race and religion and disability and disability mental health. and mental health conditions mm, mm. so essentially what happens is that now you can pretty much make a formal complaint and then your employer will have a system that uh, will help them look into it and properly address passed, yep. yeah, whether there is discrimination that has happened and then to help to mediate an outcome. Wasn't this always available in Singapore? 
It was in the f- it, it was in the form of uh, TAFEP. Mm. We've had experience in managing workplace fairness for over a decade under the Tripartite Alliance for Fair Employment Practices or TAFEP mm. for right. short. The commonest complaints mm. centers around nationality, right? Race, language, religion. Centers on age, right? And the last thing is on sex. And sex mainly marital status, those with caregiving mm. responsibilities, right. pregnancy status and so on. Mm. So if you look at the, the entire sort of uh, um, uh, type of complaints that we receive, 95% of our complaints just borders on these five characteristics. You know, Today, uh, this is before the law comes into place, right? The tool is actually quite blunt. We can require them, we can suspend uh, the work pass privileges and so on, but not all the companies uh, may end up having foreign work pass. So how do we get right. after them? So the whole idea of enshrining that five protected characteristics into law is that now we can actually meet out specific measures. We can say that you, you have to do corrective order or you have to pay a fine to the to the to uh, uh, you make some compensation. We can even have the the amounts that's in in place. Right. But okay, we okay. wanted couldn't be done before this. Yeah. I so see. and we wanted to be very sure-footed. We also don't want this thing to 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 have a, a runaway kind of thing, and then no nobody would dare to be a boss because you know you end up everybody just you know going to a very yeah. litigious and acrimonious like, type of work mm. culture. That then will set us back. So we yeah. thought that we scripted very carefully to to this five protected characteristics which we have the most experience in dealing with. But discrimination in regards to gender, sexual orientation and criminal history, is there a reason why that's not covered? So today, all forms of discrimination will not be tolerated. Now, in terms of moving up to law where you have a lot more prescriptive type of uh, standards itself, we want to be sure-footed. Right? So it doesn't mean that they are not covered. Right. They are covered under TAFEP as it is as we speak today. Mm-hmm. You want to make sure that you can do something when you got there, you do it well. Rather than at, in one fell soup, you try and take a lot of things but then you cannot right. handle it uh, uh, appropriately. So it's not that as if we're not, we're not going to cover that. We are, but it, it's not like one fell soup you can cover 100%. You also need to, to understand uh, the complexities of the framework, the context, right. okay, mm. and also what are the thought process and so on. What was the agreement they have gone into before before that? So because of that, it takes a different level of sensitivity. It also takes a lif- different level of understanding. So right. that scaling is actually more difficult. Right. So while people may say that, hey, you know, why 95%? But the fact of the matter is that you cover 95% of the glass, you know, you only 5% mm. of, of water left to fill. So let's focus on making sure that we move this thing forward, yeah. mm. right? And not falter, right? And then you, you, you bring the rest. It's in tandem with what we've always been doing, right? This is the first step. Right. Five protected crises meeting is just five steps, but this is significant. Right. It's landmark and it's historic for us. And like I said, in five years, we will review. You mentioned about like this legislation having like a very clear like pen like having very clear penalties and to like avoid litigious like situation. Is that in particular like we see in countries like US where like almost every day there's always lawsuits and lawsuits around like discrimination? Is it to avoid a situation like that? It's not just the US alone. Um, we've also seen other jurisdictions and so on. Even today, in the UK, the Equality Act it is still being revised. Right. Right. right? So. Suffice to say today, this is not the, 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 the be all and end all. It's mm. also a live document. And it's always like that. Some will say, you wa- I want you to move faster. <laughs> Some will say, hey, I think you're moving too fast, you know, mm. right? Mm. So important for us to do is to find that, that middle path, you know, that balance mm. that can bring the vast majority, the broad swath of, of the working population alongside with us without necessarily making it so prohibitive Mm. So as to turn away foreign investors. Right. Also to not waste too much of time, you know, on just hours and hours and hours, days and you know, and weeks and months of litigation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that doesn't benefit anyone. Now, um, in a workplace fairness legislation, anyone that has a, a complaint, the company must have a grievance handling framework. They can also go to the union and then only if it fails, they come to us. TAFEP for the mediation part, right? And 
in the, as a last resort, it can go to the ECT, which is a tribunal, which will then determine what is the, 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 the penalty. Okay. Yeah. Right. But we are also cognizant of the fact that, look, there are many small, medium enterprises, correct? I mean, those that um, have less than 25 employees they may not have uh, HR departments yeah. they may not have you know so so we give them a five year period for them to move up but in that period what we will do is that we will push uh, clinics out to them we will work with them right. we'll give them the advice from like now uh, no from the time the law is in, in place right yeah but of course we hope they can start as early as possible mm. so there will be all this help and all that kind of things to help them there was actually quite an uh, interesting comment that I saw that uh, this person was asking why not we just mandate that companies cannot ask for nationality, sex, age and all these during job applications. There's no one size fits all because it does depend on, on, uh, on the type of work. Right? For instance, if um, uh, I, I'm running a spa, for instance, right? And my clients are primarily women. Therefore, is it uh, discriminatory if I say that because I'm running a spa for women and that uh, I would prefer uh, um, uh, 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 masseuse who are, who are ladies because mm. Mm. The, the client itself is, 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 is different in a sense. So to sort of have a, a blank kind of uh, um, uh, or blanket type of, of um, application form or whatever it is for everyone uh, and, and to, to sort of assume that you can have a one-size-fits-all, I think the, the jury is still out. La. With regards to where a worker can turn to, right? Some of the con uh, I've seen a few comments that are mentioning that it seems like the c process can be quite drawn out. Like I complain after it go to settlement, then settlement, then blah blah blah. So a lot of people might feel like I just don't want to go through this trouble, so I just leave it and move on, no? The whole idea of of putting it into law is to ensure that at every step of the way, our Singaporeans are given equal opportunity. But it is also important for the employee or the person to be employed to take that ownership, that, that step first of making sure that he is fighting for his own right. If he doesn't even want to take the step mm. right, of fighting for his own right, then how do we even know in the first place to help them? Right. <laughs> right. So I, I think when we talk about burden of proof, right? We are asking the person to be able to tell us when did it happen, mm. what was the, the, the nature of the, of the interview, what was the nature. If the, as of the outset, the person says, I cannot remember the day, I cannot remember them, then where do we start? Right. Now, the only one thing that I must add is that I cannot guarantee outcome that is the same for everyone. Mm. I don't think anyone in this world can guarantee equal outcome. Mm. But at every step of the way, there will be equal opportunity, right? I mean, in this day and age, you, all of you, you're our future, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all of you are. Mm. At some stage, I will hand over the baton to you all, you know? I mean, yeah. your generation and all that. Yeah. My two lai two ke you know? <laughs> you know, I hand it over to you all, you know? Right? If you don't fight for yourself, then when I reach this, the point in time where I need, I need care, you know, can I depend on, you don't even fight for yourself, can I depend for you to fight on me, fight for me? Right. Right. This is a. This is who we are as a people. Well put. This is a stage of life you get when you're like somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the somebodies we've had on the show, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They start thinking in generations. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah true, we're thinking true. about next week. Oh, yeah. It's a hierarchy of needs. Once you get to yeah, yeah. there's there's self actualization was too all, all encompassing. <laughs> <laughs> too encompassing. There, there's another one. Yeah, it's self perpetualization. I oh, see. Yay. That's why they go all, like cryo freezing and shit. <laughs> thank you very thank much, you. Minister, for thank joining you. us, and thank, thank you for you. watching. See you in the next episode. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Like, share, subscribe. Something else that I uh, found out through the interwebs, actually through your lunch with Sumiko, I read that up until about like ten years ago, you actually like were more than a hundred kg. Oh, oh shit! So wow. give me some weight loss tips. You walk. I walk every day. That's it. For how long? Uh, for the weight loss to sustain it, so you need to do about. Uh, at least seven, eight thousand steps a day. Probably about five, uh, click. five click. Yeah, four, oh. four point, four point. Oh, that's eight. wild! Yeah. I struggle to do two k. Yeah. But for people like yourself, because you're so slim to begin with, you probably need longer. <laughs> 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 very good, very good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>